One of the things that you must know from your own experience, of course, is this, the, the area you mentioned is partially government controlled, partially not. So obviously that it's in the throes of, of a civil war and part of this international conflict. One of the hesitations that I'm sure a lot of countries have is to be giving money that may go to the regime as opposed to the people in need. What, what are you seeing at this point? I mean, really, is there sufficient access that it's through UN channels that people should be donating? Or, or what's likely to have the most traction in terms of achieving results for people in that area? At this stage, governments really need to go ahead and start doing this because, as you point out, it's actually very hard for people like ourselves to donate directly. We can donate and we should to groups like the White Helmets, who are the this extraordinary group of you know, volunteers that have expertise in uh, pulling civilians from the rubble. And there are others like Violet, like Molham, like the Syrian American Medical Services. But, um, you know, for years we've been fed this narrative that, oh, they're all terrorists, we can't, you know, we can't, uh, you're not allowed to help them. And this myth that um, the sanctions are responsible for for these uh, abhorrent living conditions. And, you know, this is just nonsense. It's really quite important to, to understand that sanctions have got nothing to do with these uh, hideous conditions in which Assad keeps politically unsympathetic or hostile areas of his population. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing to do with that. And what is even worse is that he has managed to uh, you know, get over the sanctions that have been imposed quite rightly because of the horrific human rights violations that he's visited on his population um, by repurposing it and by taking control. So, you know, the problem. there are two problems. Part of the problem is that the UN has adopted this very narrow interpretation of its powers and way back in 2013 was very unwilling for uh, any UN agency or indeed any agency to provide cross-border aid mm -hmm. unless the country permitted or, or unless there was a Security Council resolution. Now that is has never been the case beforehand and you know, this is the whole point of the humanitarian imperative that we provide aid. Uh, however, we do so. We recognize sovereignty, but there comes a point when, if the government is not able or not willing to provide aid and to protect its citizens, and this is what the Security Council resolutions of 2014 showed us, that then you have to have, uh, then you have to be able to go forward directly. But. The, the depending on a Security Council resolution doesn't get us very far. I mean, think about it. If we're only going to invest in another two, uh, or if, if all we want is another two additional border crossings for a few months, mm -hmm. then that in no way you know, helps us meet the massive scale. So it's like all border crossings should be open. We should be able to get in there every which way we can. We need to get in by air, by sea, by land. To provide whatever is needed as fast as possible you know the earthquake showed us you need speed and you need scale and therefore at this stage it should be absolutely obvious that we cannot allow uh, our humanitarian response to be held hostage by russia's position on the security council because it simply doesn't uh, want and neither does assad there is no interest in helping these incredibly vulnerable uh, parts of its population